this is the cost per kilo or pound of getting something into Earth orbit, payload or human or whatever it might be. And it's a logarithmic plot. And if you look, the cost per kilo of getting to Earth orbit has gone down by a factor of 10 in the last decade. That's mostly the work of SpaceX and its reusable rockets. And that's a dramatic improvement. And that's what's going to take space travel and recreation from the vein of billionaires to the vein of millionaires to perhaps average middle class people. If you project this curve another decade or so, it's going to drop another factor of 10. And at that point, when getting to orbit is $100 per kilo, multiply by the 60 or 70 kilos of an average person, and you can see that's about the cost of a fancy cruise. So people are going to be able to do it who are not super wealthy. That's the future, and it's not that far away. If this curve continues and we get things like space elevators, then space travel essentially becomes free. So what's on the horizon? Some of these predictions are easy to make and some are not so easy to make. It's clear that we're gonna go back to the moon. The visualization here of the Lunar X Prize is one of the very few prizes that didn't succeed. Google offered a prize to any private or university entity that could land a rover on the moon, travel 500 meters and send back data. Nobody won the prize by the deadline, but again, a lot of innovation happened. And so we will be going back to the moon, the nearest place, uh, with a lot of robotic instruments. Now, it's worth remembering there are no rules in space. It's kind of a wild west, a kind of a wild frontier. There really have been only several treaties that deal with space, uh, but they don't talk about the commercialization of space at all. So things are gonna happen that we might not like. Those treaties are worth mentioning. The only two major space treaties by the United Nations were the Space Treaty of 1965. And that was very important because it essentially tried to rule out nukes in space or weapons in space. And it was signed by the major spacefaring powers and by about 170 countries, except for a few rogue states. The only other treaty though was the 1979 Moon Treaty that tried to deal with the ownership issue. And while it said that governments could not own property in space, it was mute to the private sector or commercial entities or individuals. And so there are no rules about that internationally. And even for governments, the rules are not binding and they're not enforced. And most of the world's spacefaring fire powers did not sign the Moon Treaty in 1979. So it is literally too that it's a kind of lawless place. And space law is one of those major, minor emerging disciplines. Many universities, including my own, are developing concentrations, if not full degrees in space law. So what might we get in the future beyond the commercialization and people traveling as tourists to space? The most dramatic game changer beyond that would be a space elevator. This is literally like an Indian rope trick. It's a cable suspended into space to the point where its centrifugal force of the spinning earth balances the weight of the cable downward with gravity. And it just hangs there suspended far above the earth's surface, even above the geocentric space limit. Now, making a space elevator in principle is doable. The engineers have been working on these ideas for decades. However, the tensile strength required to make a space elevator on the Earth is beyond current capabilities, even using the fanciest nanofiber technologies that we have. It's not, however, impossible to do one on the moon with one-sixth the Earth's gravity. What you get with a lunar with space elevator is a way essentially to get to zero gravity and anywhere in the solar system, therefore, for free, because you can move stuff up and down the space elevator with solar powered lifters, which you can see in the picture here as a visualization, of course. Um, and so this is an enormous thing because most of the cost of getting into Earth orbit is the fuel, it's just lifting against gravity. That's what makes it expensive. And the energy cost of getting to Earth orbit is about half the total energy cost of getting to Mars. So if you can get to Earth orbit essentially free or construct things in Earth orbit and then send them elsewhere, you're saving an enormous amount of money. Like I said, a space elevator on the Earth is not possible right now, but with advances in nanotechnology, it could well be possible within a few decades. Cost of a space elevator, hard to tell. Estimates have ranged from five to $10 billion. And that sounds like a lot, but it's actually not because commercial entities collaborating on this would very soon see an economic payoff. There's also the idea of mining asteroids. That also sounds fanciful, but I think will also happen within a few decades. The curve on the top left is the cost of aluminum 
uh, which fuels the industrial revolution or the modern revolution of the 20th century. And aluminum used to be expensive and now it's sort of dirt cheap and it's built into everything. Well, eventually you need the cost of materials of our modern civilization based on electronics to come down. And so we need to harvest more of those materials. These are finite resources. Well, if you can harness one of the near earth asteroids uh, and bring it into a looping elliptical orbit of the earth moon system, something about 500 kilometers across will contain at current market value, about $2 trillion worth of precious metals. They're used in, in industrial processes and another $2 trillion in rare earths, which are essential in the semiconductor industry. That's an enormous amount of wealth locked up in a space rock. And so the incentive to do this is of course high. Now the danger is that you could crater the market and lower the price if you monopolize it. This is the famous thing the Hunt brothers did in the 1980s where they tried to corner the market in silver and the silver price cratered and they lost their fortunes. So you have to be careful when you're doing this. But I think mining asteroids is gonna happen. Fortunes will be made and fortunes will be lost. We'll also go to Mars. And Mars, of course, is more exciting than the moon. The moon is quite close. Mars is a place where we can't actually live on the surface. There's essentially no atmosphere, um, but it's a world that we would love to colonize. And at some point in the far future, we might. There are fairly advanced designs, including this one from the European Space Agency of how we might set up a habitat on Mars containing maybe six to 10 people who are self-sufficient in their living capabilities. We may change when we're on Mars with the lower gravity and the very artificial environment. If people live and die on Mars, they will literally change. Their bodies will change. Evolution will be accelerated for people who live on Mars, the Mars colonists. This may happen in tens or hundreds of generations. And eventually off Earth people will become a new species, formally a new species, which is either an exciting or a scary thought, depending on how you think of it. And because if we build on Mars, we will have to send a fair amount of people there doing construction and building infrastructure, there are definitely gonna be jobs on Mars.